um, I have a few announcements to prepare you for the next coming weeks. Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening. Yay! <laughs> I'm excited about it. I hope you're excited about it too. Um, next week is a big Sunday. We're going to have a congregational meeting immediately following worship to hear a report from the nominating committee about uh, session for next year. So please plan to be here. We're going to figure out, we're going to practice. Tim, don't let me forget to talk about how we're going to do Zoom it, for those who join us by Zoom um, in that meeting. And then immediately following that, in place of Sunday school, will be our Operation Christmas Child packing party. And it's going to be outside um, with goodies and other fun things. So plan to stay after worship. Karen's excited about it. <laughs> um, so plan to stay with us. There was a list of needed supplies um, in the email on Thursday. But if you have any questions about that, you can talk to Elaine. I'm sure she has an updated list. Or she can at least tell you. Um, yes, yeah, some of those are hard to get just in life. Um, and uh, Jeremy wanted me to remind you, if you have a youth who is sixth grade or older and would like to come to the lock-in on the 20th of November, please let him or John Irvin know so that they can plan um, for that. It sounds like they're going to go ice skating, maybe, tentatively, <laughs> um, ice skating, and then have a lock-in after that. Joyce, you had an announcement? Mm -hmm. For the next two Sundays, we will be collecting goodies for our college students in that time. So if you can help us fill up these bags, uh, we do this every year for college students who have to go back after Thanksgiving to study for exams. So it's, it's our way of loving them. So next two Sundays. What else is that going to be? Snacks, goodies. Have to be Elaine. So if you are a veteran or know of a veteran who um, we would like to honor them on Veterans Day Sunday, so Elaine wants to make sure we have a good list. So if you know of a veteran or are a veteran, make sure you talk to Elaine so that we have, we make sure we don't leave anybody off of that list. George. Uh, to kind of speak back on that, if you're a veteran or loved one with the Vietnam title, uh, we'll be doing our annual Veterans Day celebration, the ROTC, the band, and the chorus will be uh, Christmas of Christ. If you came in there, we'll see a bunch of other Probably the best thing that happens at West Idol all year. It's the only place I've ever done such a make such a big deal out of it. But the little things you've never been, um, so like that Colonel Van Deep at the high school, he'll give you all the details. But uh, check that webpage out. Uh, they just uh, do the Christmas Christmas thing. That's at ten o'clock on Wednesday. Any other announcements? <coughs> Let us worship God together. Let's join together in our responsive call to worship. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let everyone who is thirsty come. Let everyone who hears say, come. Let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes take the water of life as a gift. Let everyone who is thirsty come. 
Come to the tree of life, the Alpha and the Omega. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Now let's stand and sing together hymn number 697, Take My Life. We will sing verses 1, 4, and 6. may be seated. Friends, let us join our hearts together in our prayer of confession. Without your power, O oh God, we are lost. We have done the things we would avoid, and what you desire we have not done. By your purifying fire, transform our lives. Guide us into honesty and compassion, so filled with your peace our dreams and visions may be one with yours. Let us continue our confession with the silent prayers of our hearts. People of God, hear the good news. God's grace is enough. Enough for us, enough for the whole world. We are forgiven and free to live without fear. Assured of the abundance of God's love is all we need. 
Praise God for satisfying our hungry hearts with prayer. Amen. Friends, I invite you to share the peace of Christ with one another by waving. We continue in prayer as we consider how we can offer our time, talent, and treasure to God. The offering plates, as well as this week's announcements, can be found in the back of the sanctuary as you leave worship today. Now I'd like to invite all our kids to come forwards for their time with the young church. Let us pray. God of all blessings, source of all life, giver of all grace, we thank you for the gift of life, for the breath that sustains life, for the food of this earth that nurtures life, for the love of family and friends without which there would be no life. We thank you for this day, for life, and one more day to love, for opportunity, and one more day to work for justice and peace, for neighbors, and one more person to love and by whom be loved, for your grace and one more experience of your presence, for your promise to be with us, to be our God and to give salvation. For these and all blessings we give you thanks, eternal loving God, through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Good morning. I have a question. Do you have something that you collect? I know Mac does, right? You collect money? <laughs> that's, that's a fun one to collect. <laughs> what do you collect, Mac? Other than what Mary said. Oh, yes. Pokemon cards. Do you? Lexi, do you collect anything? Really? Wow. Caitlin? Rocks. Rocks are a fun collection. Isaac, do you have something you collect? Race cars. Race cars. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. Well, I brought 
part of one of my collections here so I could show you because it's kind of funny. Um, so when I was a little girl about your ages, I collected badges because I was a Girl Scout. So that was one of my collections. But then I'm not a Girl Scout anymore. So I started collecting things that are not worth anything to anybody else. Mac, are your Pokemon cards worth something? Yes, they are, right? Um, and rocks can be worth things, and collecting coins can be worth something, right? Um, my, my collection is not worth anything. Here is an item from my collection. <laughs> it's Ari's last pacifier. So it's still in here. This is a ring that Ian gave me that came out of a quarter machine. Probably not worth anything. And the rest of this box is filled with cards that my children have made for me. So that's my collection. Now, it's not really worth anything, but I would be really sad if I lost it. Is there, if, if Mac, if somebody broke into your house and stole all of your Pokemon cards, you'd be really sad, right? Mm hmm And Caitlin, if somebody, if you lost all of your rocks, you would be really sad, wouldn't you? Yes. And if there was a big flood and it destroyed all the cards that my children have made for me over the years, I would be really sad. So Jesus says that we shouldn't store up this kind of treasure on earth because things can happen to it. It could be stolen or it could be destroyed. It's not going to last forever, is it? No. So what are something that, what's something that we can store? What's something that is... We, we talk about storing up treasures in heaven, and that's kind of a complicated phrase. What is a treasure in heaven? Get, how about we take that and we translate that to giving money to either people, the, either the church so that they can do things with it in the community and help people, or to people who don't have food. That's exactly where I was going. So helping people is a treasure in heaven. Right, or don't have clean water. Exactly right. What about your your um, prayers? Are those treasures in heaven? Talking to God? Yes. yes. So when you help somebody or you... Um, okay, yes, exactly. Those are treasures in heaven. So we're going to focus on not on our, necessarily on our own collections of things, but on our treasures in heaven. Okay, let's have a prayer. Dear God, we want to be our hearts to be with you. Help us to concentrate on storing up treasures in heaven by obeying you, helping others, and sharing Jesus with our friends, and spending time in church worshiping, learning, working, and serving. Amen. Our New Testament scripture reading this morning is from the first letter to Timothy, chapter 6, verse, I'm going to start with verse 11 through verse 21. It goes like this. But as for you, person of God, run away from all these things. Instead, pursue righteousness, holy living, faithfulness, love, endurance, and gentleness. Compete in the good fight of faith. Grab hold of eternal life. You were called to it, and you made a good confession of it in the presence of many witnesses. I command you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and Christ Jesus, who made the good confession when testifying before Pontius Pilate, obeying this order without fault or failure until the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. Tell people who are rich at this time not to become egotistical and not to place their hope on their finances, which are uncertain. Instead, they need to hope in God, who richly provides everything for our enjoyment. Tell them to do good, to be rich in the good things. When they do these things, they will save a treasure for themselves that is a good foundation for the future. That way, they can take hold of what is truly life. Timothy, protect what has been given to you in trust. 
avoid godless and pointless discussions and the contradictory claims of so-called knowledge. When some people adopted this false knowledge, they missed the point of faith. May grace be with you all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I sometimes struggle with Paul. Paul is sometimes a difficult person to, to, um, to like, <laughs> to enjoy. Sometimes he's a little bit bossy. Um, he does what some people say, um, he goes from preaching into meddling, you know? And nothing goes quite so quickly from preaching into meddling as talking about money. But we're gonna do that this morning, so strap in. Money is an awkward thing to talk about. It's one of those uh, things that your mother told you not to talk about in polite company, right? We don't talk about politics and we don't talk about money. You can talk about the weather and you can talk about sports teams, but we don't talk about what's in people's bank accounts. And yet Paul never really cared about what was polite table conversation. He always went right for whatever was the most difficult topic of conversation. And this morning, he was talking to Timothy about the most hot-button issue in the life of the church, money. It seems Timothy was trying to deal with the same problem, the same issue that has plagued God's people throughout the beginning of time. And that is the question of the relationship between money, between material possessions, our pursuit of wealth, which somehow we've equated with happiness, and our relationship with other people in the community. Timothy's problem is as old as time. In fact, one of the very first stories in the Bible, if you pull it, pull it out and look at Genesis, is about money. Way back in Genesis, do you remember what Cain and Abel were fighting about? It seems that one of them had a better offering, more money to give than the other did. The second story in the Bible right after creation. Or what about the one where Rebecca and Jacob destroy their entire family? so that Jacob can steal Esau's birthright. It's throughout the Bible, the whole Bible, it's all about money. Moses, Jeremiah, Amos, Habakkuk, Elijah, Ezekiel, Micah, and Jesus, all of them, every one of them, has stories to tell about how money affected their community. Micah goes so far as to say, you know what's right, you know what you're supposed to do, and yet you choose to do the wrong thing. Paul is just the latest in a long line. Paul tells us that money isn't evil. Money isn't bad. You can have money. It's okay to be rich. It's okay to be wealthy, Paul says. The problem with money is that we tend to love it. We tend to love money. And when we talk about money, when we think about money, we have a problem with what we do with money. See, the love of money, it leads to all kinds of evil. It leads to racism and sexism and slavery and prostitution and predatory lending practices, oppression, all kinds of things, absentee landlords, corrupt governments. It's all down to the love of money. And it's something that all of us, every single one of us, is susceptible to. Maybe you don't find yourself on that list of evils that I just read out, but I guarantee somewhere in your life you have an unhealthy relationship with money. It's sort of the root of all kinds of things. Because money is essential to life, you have to have it to live. It's like my friend who went into Overeaters Anonymous. She said the problem with Overeaters Anonymous is you can't stop eating. You have to eat. It's not like Alcoholics Anonymous where you go and they say, you know, just stop drinking alcohol. And you could theoretically live your life without it, but you can't stop eating food. So how do you deal with an addiction to something that you can't stop using? Money's like that for us. And Paul tells them that their trust and their belief in money as a source of protection, it's really just a belief, a fear of scarcity. It's not even about the money, he says. Timothy, he says, your, your fear is the problem. Your worry is the problem. You're afraid that you're gonna run out of things. You're afraid of scarcity. You're afraid of how this money affects your community and its ability to live together. The members of Timothy's community, they hold tightly to their money. They lord it over one another. 
I'm more righteous because I have more money, and one group says. And the other group says, well, I'm more righteous because I gave away all my money to the poor, and so I'm better than you because I'm more pure. And both of them are just using it as a cudgel, as an idol, as, a, as something to use as a dividing line. The problem isn't the money. It's their fear, their worry, their anxiety. It's what they do. Money is an inanimate object. It has no value in and of itself. It is not good or bad, it just is. It's what we do with it. It's the way we set it up as an altar, as an idol in our lives that causes the problem. And money is not the only altar we set up in our lives, if we're being honest. We have all kinds of altars. Altars are simply objects, something external to us, something that we use to bring us closer to God, to allow a moment of awareness of the holy. We have to be careful about these altars because altars quickly become idols. Idols and altars, they're the same object. It's what we do in response to them. They're not capable in and of themselves of doing anything at all. This table cannot rise up and do anything in and of itself, but it can become either an altar or an idol, depending upon how we view it. The object is not the problem. We set up altars, we set up altars all over the place, and they're okay. Altars are good. Altars are an access point to a deeper meaning, a deeper purpose, a deeper function. If you go to my mother's house, there is a wall of family pictures. It's so all the way up, it goes two stories of family pictures in my mom's house. It has certificates and awards and things that we earned, children, her children earned over their school lives. It's an altar. It's a way in which she remembers time. It's a way in which she remembers to be thankful for her children. Or as she used to like to say when we were being exceptionally teenagery, these pictures remind me not to lock you in your room. Those pictures are an altar, a way for her and us to be thankful. Or maybe your altar look more like habits and routines which bring you closer to God. My friend Anthony has a routine. He goes into work a half an hour early every day. He does it partly to avoid traffic because traffic in Charlotte is not always a good, a good thing to do. And so he goes into work a half an hour early and he uses that extra time to read the Bible and to pray. He spends time with God. Or maybe your altar is a relationship which supports you, which helps you grow in your faith, whether it's friends or family or whoever it is who brings us an extra dose of kindness or an extra viewpoint into the holy, a place where we can be honest about our struggles, a small group, a person who lets us tell our story judgment-free, which can help us see how God is active. We all have altars. And altars are good. We should have them. We should set them up, and we should use them to see God. But altars become idols when they no longer have any meaning. That is, they no longer have any meaning that's external to themselves. You know what I mean? Where they no longer are a viewpoint to God, but simply something we worship in place of God. Altars become idols when they themselves are the meaning, are the purpose. Even good things can be idols. I wonder sometimes about, remember that Marie Kondo trend about five years ago? Did anybody else throw away all their stuff? <laughs> we watched Marie Kondo. She was on Netflix, and she had, I think it was called The Artist's Simplicity or something like that. Anyway, she invited you to go through your house, and you were to hold each object in your house and you were to hold it and spend time with this object and then ask yourself, does this spark joy? Anybody else do this? I did one Saturday. I went through my house and I held an object and I said, does this spark joy? And if it didn't spark joy anymore, she said to throw it away. Throw it away or donate it, but whatever it is, get out of the house, right? And the idea was that even if you just bought it, it can become an idol if it no longer has any value or purpose in your life. All these idols, these things that we hold on to, it's amazing, really, how long we hold on to things past when they have any meaning or purpose. Altars become idols all the time. Maybe that idol for you is something that used to bring you deep value and purpose. 
Maybe it's something that has fond memories for you. Maybe it's a wall of pictures that has extreme value but for you, but has become an idol instead of an altar. Because you've gotten so used to seeing it in the same place time after time that you forget to look and be thankful. Maybe your idol is an altar that used to bring you purpose and joy, but you just do it every day because you've always done it that way every day. Because you see, idols and altars have a fine line. An idol can become an altar because an idol doesn't require anything from us at all, right? If you set up an idol, all an idol does is sit there and you look at it and then you move on. They're objects, habits, ideas which do nothing for us except give us something nice to look at. Maybe your idol is comfort food like macaroni and cheese or chocolate cake or fast food and they make your tummy full but they give you no nutritional value. They're easy, they require nothing. Altars, on the other hand, require sacrifice. They require us to be different, to be something else. When we bring an offering to God and place it on the altar, if it's a true offering of thanksgiving, it requires effort and sacrifice. It hurts. Sacrifice hurts. Altars require us to give up to open our hands up and to give something away freely. God asks nothing more from us than to offer ourselves at the altar. And it's hard. It's difficult. It challenges. It hurts sometimes. And I'm not saying there isn't room for comfort food on a rainy day. And I'm not saying we have to completely give everything away, that you have to go home and spark joy with every object in your house. But I am saying that if something no longer brings you value, you need to look at it and ask, is this an idol or an altar? If it no longer requires some sort of sacrifice, some sort of effort on your part, then is it an idol or an altar? God asks us to be willing to question, to look at things anew every day, and to be willing to offer up even the things that are the most valuable. So whatever it is that you're holding on to most tightly, whatever it is that you are unwilling to offer to God, I invite you to consider, is it an altar? Is it bringing you value and purpose and meaning? Is it showing you God? Or has it become an idol that sits on your shelf and looks pretty but does nothing and requires nothing? There are altars everywhere. There are altars and opportunities everywhere. And so are you facing an altar or holding on to an idol? Amen. as we continue to pray. May today there be peace within. May I trust God that I am exactly where I am meant to be. May I not forget the infinite possibilities that are born of faith.
May I use those gifts that I have received and pass on the love that has been given to me. May I be confident knowing I am a child of God. Let this awareness settle into my bones and allow my soul the freedom to sing, to dance, to praise, and to love. It is there for each and every one of us. Gracious God, when the days grow darker, casting long, cold shadows, allowing fear and despair into our lives, let my light shine brighter. When the task grows more wearisome, filling valleys and flattening mountains, build highways in the desert. Be the strength in my bones. When I wait on you and they shake their heads saying, have you not heard the news? Keep in my heart the good news that makes even the child in the womb leap with joy. You are coming into the world. And when the last glowing beam disappears over the horizon and darkness shrouds the land, give me the grace to say, despair, despair not, for morning is coming. Come, Lord Jesus. Come as we continue to pray, lifting one voice as one voice, using the words you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen i invite you to rise in body or spirit and join me in the last hymn number 700 i'm gonna live so
Are you living your life with closed fists, clenching on to the things that you hold dear to you? Are you living your life open-handed and open-armed, waiting for God's blessings and seeking them out? What in your life has become an idol that used to be an altar? I invite you to go forth, offering yourself to God. Now I put your hands out, open yourself, open up wide so you can receive the benediction. May the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and into the life everlasting. Amen.